So I would like to introduce our next presenter today. Um, Dr. Dan Holland is an associate professor in entrepreneurship and strategy. His research centers on entrepreneurial decision making with a particular interest in the factors that affect persistence. He has also participated in research related to ethics, creativity, and entrepreneurship pedagogy. Dan has a passion for teaching entrepreneurship strategy and management courses. He received his PhD from Indiana University and his MBA and bachelor's in engineering from BYU. Prior to joining Academe, uh, he worked with, uh, for a dozen years in a variety of engineering, marketing, and management roles in the high-tech industry. His interests include traveling with family, playing a variety of sports, and people watching, and I feel like we're going to get some great entertainment this afternoon. I want to... So if you would welcome Dr. Holland. Are you good with having this guy on too? Or? Yes, I'm just okay. going to use this one, I think. Perfect. Can you hear that OK? All right, so I want your opinions, OK? A, a teacher walks in the classroom looking like this. And what are you thinking? Uh-oh, OK, I like that, uh-oh. What else? <laughs> what am I thinking, yeah. Come on, give me some real th thoughts. What goes through your mind? OK, so now why would you say that? Uh, so he said, this is going to be a real fun class. Why would you think that? OK, so different. It, it feels different, huh? And so you think, hey, maybe it'll be different, and, and different is the same as fun? OK, good. What other things do you think? OK, willing to take risks. Yeah, immediately you notice that, that uh, this person is, doesn't fit within the safe, comfortable mold, right? Willing to take risks. Good. You make me nervous on that. <laughs> <laughs> you know CPR, right? Help me out if I fall. Okay. <laughs> it won't help my broken CPR, won't? Yeah, that's true. Oh, that really hurts. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, so you see confidence. Confidence may lead to uh, some sort of intimidation. Is this something that, uh, you know, I even want to be here with someone that uh, looks like that, acts like that, dresses like that? Where's a... Uh... Go ahead, Dave. Okay, good. Uh, other thoughts come to mind? Let's... Yeah, please. Very good. I, thank you. So, so the judgments start coming, though, right, immediately, right? And you're going, whoa, 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 I shouldn't be judging. This, uh, you know, who knows why or whatever, and uh, uh, I shouldn't jump to conclusions about this person, and let's see if I can learn something from him or her. Very good. I like that. Okay, so let's break this down a little bit differently. Let's uh, say just from the neck up, okay? Welcome. From the neck up, okay? You're looking at this part in a teacher. What are the things you're thinking? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you start to think some of those things. Huh? Wow, that, that piercing thing, what, why would you do that? Or how can you see with that, okay? What type of class do you think I might be teaching from the neck up? Philosophy? Philosophy? Guitar? So, guitar? Okay, something music related, huh? The history of rock and roll, yeah? Yeah, I mean, it changes the credibility, right? If I'm an accounting professor and I look like this, what are you thinking? I mean, that just does not work, right? But if I am teaching rock and roll, then you're thinking, hey, this may work, huh? We make judgments like that, right? We're trying to make sense of it, and we start to put pieces together. We may even jump to conclusions, make uh, different stereotypes and whatnot. 
But you may think about, huh, I wonder what lifestyle. Do you think I drink and do drugs? Probably have at some point. Do you jump to that? You may not admit that, but we may jump to that conclusion, right? That, uh, you know, listen to certain kinds of music. You start thinking about lifestyle judgments and whatnot. All right. And it doesn't fit within the norm of what we ex would expect at a Utah State class. Right? And when it doesn't fit in that norm, we're really trying to make sense of it and trying to do something to figure out, okay, why does this person look like this? And what does that mean for me as a student? Right? And so students are trying to make sense. Good. Okay, what about from the waist to the neck? Pretty, probably don't even think much about it at all, right? Fits a fairly traditional. Um, you've seen many teachers look like that. Uh, you make any particular judgments about it? How about, sorry, conservative? Yeah. Boring. Boring? Yeah, you might think that, huh? What about grading? Which one's going to grade harder, this one or this one? This one, huh? We would start to think, we, isn't that amazing how you can determine what the grading's going to be like just by the way I look? But you would start to think that, huh? Conservative, maybe a little more strict, probably not as fun. Um, uh, it's going to be a, a kind of a straightforward class following the, the rules and whatnot. Uh, and we, we start to just kind of make, uh, fill in those blanks, right? Okay. Whoa, every time I bend over, I get really loud, sorry. Uh, from the, uh, the waist to the knees. Sir, <laughs> okay, yeah. Laid back, feel pretty casual. Not, out of, not completely out of the norm. I'd say most students would say that. But you do start to make judgments about what they might be like. Huh? All right, the really challenging one. The shoes. Okay, in touch with my feminine side. Huh? And you, may, you do start to think, right? And, and, and uh, uh, you may even think about sexual preference or, or whatever based on shoes that I'm wearing, right? It may not, you don't typically think, oh, he's not all that tall. Maybe he just wants to be taller. <laughs> or maybe the shoes are just comfortable. Maybe they are. <laughs> Maybe some of you know that they're not, and therefore, <laughs> therefore you wouldn't jump to that conclusion. But we start to make these judgments, right? And we do this all the time. This is how we make sense of the world, like we mentioned. Uh, and, and we have also... I'm going to take this uh, off, because that really does hurt. We are always trying to understand... So we've got all these sights, sounds, smells, tastes, all these things happening all around us, and we want to make sense of it. And uh, we do that in the classroom, we do that in all aspects of life. Most of it we've seen before, and it doesn't stand out to us, right? Even a fire alarm these days, how do you respond to a fire alarm? If you're like me, you do nothing for as long as possible, right? Hoping that it goes off because I've had so many fire alarms in my life and never has there been a fire. Therefore, I've trained myself to not pay attention to it. But other things that are out of the ordinary, we pay, we pay attention to, it catches our attention and we try to make sense. And there are different stereotypes that we use in making sense of the world. Those stereotypes aren't necessarily bad. Uh, they're things that we do. They're shortcuts, aren't they? So you see someone dressed like this and you have some stereotype about it. You make kind of judgments about it. Not that big of a deal. Stereotypes obviously have a downside and we could talk forever about that. But the fact that we do it, so we just got new shirts in our management department the other day and they didn't ever ask me my shirt size but they probably went through and looked and said, okay, yeah, I kind of know what he's like, what he's like, what he's like, what she's like, what she's like, guessed what the sizes were and passed them out accordingly, right? Based on stereotypes, maybe, by male-female ratio or whatnot. That's okay. That's how we do it. It's a shortcut. 
But we have to understand the downside of that. We have to know the perceptions that we have and what stereotypes do we have about teaching? What do we have about students? What do we have about the world around us? And how does it affect the way we perform? How does it affect the way we teach? And how does it affect, how does it affect, how does it affect students' learning? Right? So I often start my entrepreneurship class just like this. Uh, uh, come in the very first impression they get of me. Uh, I walk in and, and do this and stand on a desk and, uh, and, and have this conversation. And then we get into a great conversation about perceptions and how those perceptions affect their choices and how it uh, uh, affects their creativity and their desire to be an entrepreneur. We talk about stereotypes of uh, entrepreneurs and what they think they're like and whether they think they're like that or not. And we just talk about the dangers of stereotypes and perceptions, misperceptions, talk about different cognitive biases that uh, we may fall prey to, and so on and so forth. And it's a, a great opportunity to really get their attention and, uh, and to have this uh, deeper conversation. So just one little thing that I wanted to show you, but I wanted you to also think about that. And what, what's the way that you think about uh, teaching and teachers and the way we teach? I'm going to take these off too so Dave doesn't have to save me when I fall. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit more about the proverbial box, right? We often talk about thinking outside of the box, and I thought, what is it like to think inside the box? So I created this. which gives me an opportunity to think inside the box. You ought to try it sometime. <laughs> and so what is this box that we think inside of? What are the things that make up the box? Norms. Yeah, absolutely. What do you mean by that? Expound on that. Very good. Absolutely. What other things are part of the box? Sorry, over here. What'd you say? Constraints. Constraints. What what types of constraints? Just the physical thing there that stops you from thinking outside the box. Okay. There's all sorts of constraints, huh? Whether it's physical, financial, intellectual, uh, all sorts of different types of constraints. Yeah. Other things? Experience. Experience. Absolutely. Give an example of that, or what you mean. Yeah, it's the way it's always been done, right? I've seen that. There's the story of, uh, of the young newlywed who uh, bought the roast and cut off the ends of the roast uh, to bake it, and her husband said, why'd you do that? And she said, I don't know, my mom always did it. And they called mom and said, Why'd you always cut off the ends of the roast? Uh, she said, I don't know, my mom always did it. And they called grandma and said, why'd you cut off the ends of the roast? Well, my pan was always too small for the roast, so I cut it off so it'd fit in the pan. But it was passed on, right? That was the way it was always done, so they just kept doing it. And uh, so experience definitely is part of the box, yeah. Other things? Yeah. Beliefs, yeah. In what way? What types of beliefs? Well, just even as a new instructor, I've been asked other instructors for help on something. And they're just their beliefs about the students and their capabilities and what they brought to the classroom sometimes limited what they were willing to do or what they were willing to encourage me to do. I'd say, oh, I want to do this activity that I read about because I was fresh out of school, you know, and super hopeful and optimistic. And they go, well, I, you know, I, I just know that that won't work. Or, because what they knew about the culture, what they believed about the students, or even their religious beliefs and the, you know, the dominant religious culture in the community, or just whatever belief system they had impacted if they could think outside the box. Very good. Beliefs color the way we perceive the world, right? Uh, whether it's from past experience or from our, our cultural or religious or, or all sorts of things, these beliefs that we uh, develop over time color the way we view the world, and that becomes part of the box. There was another hand over here. Yeah, yeah? what do you mean?
Okay, so creativity is part of the box or helps us break out of the box? Well, I mean, it limits creativity. Okay, the box does, yeah. Okay, absolutely. Other things come to mind that you want to share? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Assumptions. Assumptions. Very much so, huh? We make all sorts of assumptions about, uh, uh, well, just about everything, don't we? <laughs> I mean, if we don't know it all right, we make assumptions. It just back to that stereotype and the perceptions that we have. We're assuming certain things, and that is definitely part of the box. So if we want to break down that box and think outside of the box instead of in the box, we need to come up with some tools and some ways to break those things down, those barriers that we have that are natural for all of us. But being aware of them is the first step, right? And then practicing and trying to overcome them is the next step. All right. So we've got a little handout we're going to pass out here. And we want to talk about a few of these things. So I got the harebrained idea. I'm gonna grab one of these. To turn it into a cootie catcher. Is that what you call it? Right? Do you remember these things? Aren't they awesome? There's no reason for it, right? No value in it, but it, I just thought it would be kind of fun. So <laughs> So I've got several different parts of the box on here. You'll see uh, as you open up your cootie catcher. And then we're going to talk about different ways to break down those pieces of the box, OK? So we're going to start with box number one, fear of failure. I don't think we actually even put that on here. But fear, do you think like fear of failure or fear of being judged by others is a big part of the box? Absolutely it is. Uh, it, it's a big part of, uh, that shuts down creativity, right? We want to be in the norm, part of that norms, right? We want to be in the norm because then we're not really noticed. Uh, uh, we don't, uh, we're not taking a risk. We're not getting out there. And we don't feel like a failure, right? It fits within that, uh, that norm. So we want to break down our fear of failure, our fear of being judged, even me coming here. So I can do this in, with students, but today I was doing this in front of my peers, and I know that some of you are out there judging away, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, I feel that, right? Now, probably it's not even close to what I feel, but if you're like me and uh, most people, we think others are judging things we do when we're a little outside the norm. Uh, and, uh, but I tried to overcome that fear, right? And, and actually showed up anyway. But, oh, I'm getting hot too. I won't get completely undressed <laughs> by the end. That's not part of it, I promise. <laughs> um, so we want to uh, be careful with perfectionism. Br Brene Brown, uh, I don't know if you've seen her TED talk or read some of her books. Uh, a gift of imperfection, daring greatly. Uh, she's a, a scholar, sociologist out of Houston, does some great work, and, and she talks about perfectionism, and, and, and it is something that uh, leads us to have this fear, right? So we want to strive to overcome that. We want to be careful not to compare uh, <laughs> to others. And this happens in all aspects of life, right? And it happens with our students. Every time they raise their hand, they're worried about what others are saying and how their comment compares to others. We have to think about that. Even in my house, uh, you know, every spring break we do kind of an art project where we all paint something. And every Halloween we do pumpkin carving, right, where everyone uh, carves. Yet it's really funny because a lot of times we don't enjoy it <laughs> because we're really worried about what our thing's going to turn out like, right? And what it looks like compared to the others, even in the family, in a safe environment. And, uh, and so if we uh, get frustrated and it doesn't meet our vision, then it becomes a bad uh, experience. And it shouldn't be that way. There should be the joy in creation rather than uh, fearing or worrying about what others are going to uh, say or, or the way we judge or judge by them. We need to... Uh, Practice failing. Now that sounds really strange, right? Um, 
But it's all about having healthy expectations. Okay, I'll pick on Dave again. Dave, do you know how to juggle? Wait a minute, I need someone that doesn't. Good. Get up and juggle for us. All three? Yeah. If I remember right, I can't do it. <laughs> All right, so he doesn't know how to juggle. Are you guys judging him harshly that those things fell on the ground? Of course not, huh? Did it feel awkward doing it in front of everyone? Only because of my peers in the classroom. I didn't have this problem. <laughs> That's right. A, a little bit, but probably not as much in this case because you knew that you weren't an expert and they know that you're not an expert. And I know you and I know I'm safe. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for participating. <laughs> but remember that if we start a new sport or something, are we harsh on the way we fail? We expect to fall when we're skiing, right? We juggle, we expect to drop it over and over and over again. Yet when we feel that there's some sort of expertise, if we flop in the classroom, it hurts, right? We're supposed to be the expert in the classroom and, uh, and it can really hurt, but we need to have a healthy expectation and say, hey, I am going to experiment in the classroom. I'm going to try things. Yes, it may fail, but you know what? I've got another class two days from now. That's one great thing about teaching is we get immediate feedback and we try something else the next time. We learn from that process and move forward. So, so getting that expectation and practicing failing and, and thinking about how do I handle failure helps us overcome that fear of failure. I think it was Emerson that said, um, let's see, do the thing you fear and the death of fear is certain. So it's about practicing, right? Getting out. My kids, a couple of my kids, were afraid to go on any roller coaster. And then for some reason, about two years ago, all of a sudden, they're willing to go on roller coasters. I have no idea. I begged them for years, you know, go on this, you'll love it. And they wouldn't try it. They changed, they tried it, they finally overcame it, and then they did the sky coaster, you know, that free fall thing at Lagoon this summer, and I was shocked. Uh, but they overcame that fear. So practice failing. Have a, a healthy uh, appreciation for it. Okay, we're going to run out of time fast. Let's, uh, let's keep going. Oh, let me tell you one other, uh, well, a couple other things. Celebrate failure. I, I do a, 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 a celebration of failure in my classroom. Google X is a big R&D uh, arm of uh, Google. They celebrate the failures they have. They give bonuses to the groups when they pull off a project and say, no, it's not going to work. Uh, they uh, give them time off. They celebrate it because that's the only way to get you to take a risk is if you know there's not a huge downside, right? And that you're learning from it and you have a good experience. A failure resume is a great assignment that I've used in class. We, we always create resumes where we talk about how great we are. Try creating a resume about your failures. Be open and honest and talk about different things you failed at in school and your personal life in different ways and, and share it with someone else. Be vulnerable and share that failure resume with someone else and it helps you uh, uh, learn to uh, deal with failure a little better. Okay, if you look at box number two, it's about past experience, the status quo. One thing uh, um, is that we really need to learn to empathize with our students and, and try to look at it from their point of view. So we know what teaching's like. We've been through 20 years of school or 30. I have no idea how many years of school I've been. Way too many. Six, eight, 12. Yeah, probably about uh, 22, three years of school, right? I know what teachers are supposed to be like. But look from the student's side, look through their eyes, empathize with them. Sometimes just sit in a classroom that someone else is teaching and just watch the students. Uh, try to see how they're engaged uh, with the class. Try to understand how they learn. Try to empathize with them. Uh, observe like Sherlock Holmes does, right? Uh, every little thing. Uh, uh, try to uh, uh, pick up on, on uh, their body language. Uh, understand uh, that our experience may be a little out of date. And there may be things that we can learn by observing others. Box three. Sometimes we say, oh, it's got to be logical. It's got to follow the rules. So 
I say challenge every assumption. An assignment I do in class is uh, assumption reversal. We'll talk about, uh, um, say, starting a restaurant. What are the things that uh, you would expect to start a restaurant? Well, you've got to find a good location. Uh, you have uh, someone at the door greeting a host. Uh, you set them at a, seat them at a table, you bring water out, you have a waiter, you have a menu, so on and so forth, right? We reverse all those assumptions and say, okay, what if you don't have a menu? What could you do? And we start to brainstorm. Okay, if you don't have a menu, then maybe you do X, Y, or Z. What if you don't have a waiter? What could you do? So we challenge, literally challenge and reverse those assumptions and start thinking about uh, different ways of looking at it. We can do that with teaching. If I don't use PowerPoint, what could I do? If I don't lecture in this way, what could I do? If I don't use this assignment, what might I do instead? Just to get us out of that, uh, that rut or that past experience, the status quo that uh, we've always worked with. Uh, box four, we believe that there is one right answer or we accept the first good answer, even though it may not be a great uh, solution, right? Um, I want to emphasize that creativity is a numbers game. Research has shown that to have a good idea, you have to have lots of ideas, okay? It is about generating a lot because our ideas stink typically. They really do. And so you need to create a lot of them and then one or two kind of rise to the top and actually become good ideas. So think about uh, generating a lot of different ideas. Think of ways to, uh, to create many. Reframe the question. Be willing to do trial and error. And know that it's an iterative process, right? You try something, it works okay. You learn from it what was good, what wasn't. You do something else to improve it. And, and uh, most creative uh, groups in business do that. It goes through many different iterations. They pivot in new directions based on the feedback that they're getting. That's a great thing about teaching is we can get immediate feedback on anything that we try. And, uh, and we shouldn't just say give up when something goes wrong or we get negative feedback. We should say, okay, what can I tweak? What can I do a little bit differently and, uh, and improve on that? Okay, box number five. I am not creative. So that's part of uh, this box too, huh? Sometimes we just feel like I'm not the creative type. So-and-so is the creative type, right? In my family, it's uh, my son, Nathan. He's the creative one in the family. But he always gets mad when we say, oh, I'm so jealous. I wish I could draw like you do, Nathan. He says, you could if you just practice because he had a sketchbook in his hand since about age eight and was practicing all the time drawing. And it's true, he wasn't a very good artist at the time, but he practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced. And so even in those creative type uh, uh, arenas that we think of music or art or whatnot, it really is about having the passion to practice, right? Uh, and uh, so we need to, um, Always uh, believe that we can learn to be creative if we want to. And then it comes down to a conscious choice. I saw some research that said that they feel that, you know, there's certainly some in, inborn talent we have, but they estimate that about two-thirds of creativity is learned and that uh, you can go through processes to improve your creativity. There's a whole slew of great books about it uh, that have different things you can practice. Uh, but then you have to make a conscious choice and be motivated to actually do it. Okay, box six is the box is comfortable. Why make a change? Why do it differently, right? It, it's comfortable to be inside the box. And so that really comes down to remembering. Does anyone have something that comes to mind right now of a time where you just felt pure joy from creating something, from doing something that you made uh, that, uh, that you'd be willing to share. And I'll bet all of you have had that feeling, and, and I'm not talking that this is some revolutionary thing, but it's making something or doing something that really created, yeah. I, I consider, but this one speaks to my soul, because I'm not a creative person. I'm ashamed to steal ideas from anyone and everyone. And recently, my 13-year-old wanted to take a painting class, one of those little go with a friend painting classes and it really was way outside of my comfort zone 
I ended up being so proud of what I made that I actually gave it to my mother as a gift and just she had tears of joy because it was just something that was so unique and she thought it was beautiful. So it was such a positive experience for me. I was quite surprised but scared. That is wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. And I think we've all had similar experiences to that. Remember the joy of creativity, even if it's something little, uh, but remember that and know that uh, uh, there is a huge upside to going out and taking that risk. And uh, um, I appreciate uh, you sharing that. Uh, um, and you talked about uh, uh, shamelessly uh, stealing ideas. Uh, uh, that's our next box. You know what? Creativity, everyone steals ideas. They are always built on some other idea. It just, no one comes up with something brand new that they've never, you know, that is completely random that they've never thought of. It is built on ideas and foundational principles and, and things from different uh, uh, areas. Maybe it's uh, uh, going out, they see different cultures or different businesses or uh, all these different things that they get uh, some sort of exposure to and then they draw in those ideas and kind of make new combinations. That's what creativity is. So we should all be very proud to steal each other's ideas and not even feel like it's stealing. It is sharing, right? That is what it's about, is that we share ideas with each other and we do it together. Make a support group for your creativity and work together as a team and network and, and share ideas and, and uh, create little groups that talk about, hey, what could I do to teach in my class this particular principle? Brainstorm together, share some ideas, then have one of them come in and observe you and, and, uh, and help you determine whether it was effective or not. I think if we can do those types of things that we could all improve our teaching quite a bit. Uh, but we have to be willing to be a little bit vulnerable and, uh, and be willing to uh, 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 work uh, uh, and reciprocate and help them as well, right? Um, okay, we're going to wrap up. Box number eight is, uh, I want you to think about something that you specifically can work on in this coming semester, okay? And I challenge you to, to pick one area that you are going to really focus on and improve in your creativity, to break down that box and, and try to come up with ways to make your teaching uh, uh, more effective, okay? I am going to finish by reading you a children's book, okay? My daughter just told me about this just a couple days ago, so Amazon Prime, I love it, got here in two days, right? What do you do with an idea by Kobe Yamada? Okay. One day I had an idea. Where did it come from? Why is it here? I wondered, what do you do with an idea? At first, I didn't think much of it. It seemed kind of strange and fragile. I didn't know what to do with it, so I just walked away from it. I acted like it didn't belong to me. But it followed me. I worried what others would think. What would people say about my idea? I kept it to myself. I hid it away and didn't talk about it. I tried to act like everything was the same as it was before my idea showed up. But there was something magical about my idea. I had to admit, I felt better and happier when it was around. It wanted food. It wanted to play. Actually, it wanted a lot of attention. It grew bigger, and we became friends. I showed it to other people, even though I was afraid of what they would say. I was afraid that if people saw it, they would laugh at it. I was afraid they would think it was silly, and many of them did. They said it was no good. They said it was too weird. They said it was a waste of time, and that it would never become anything. And at first, I believed them. I actually thought about giving up on my idea. I almost listened to them. But then I realized, what do they really know? 
This is my idea, I thought. No one knows it like I do. And it's okay if it's different and weird and maybe a little crazy. I decided to protect it, to care for it. I fed it good food and I worked with it. I played with it. But most of all, I gave it my attention. My idea grew and grew, and so did my love for it. I built it a new house, one with an open roof where it could look up at the stars, a place where it could be safe to dream. I liked being with my idea. It made me feel more alive, like I could do anything. It encouraged me to think big and then to think bigger. It shared its secrets with me. It showed me how to walk on my hands because, it said, it is good to have the ability to see things differently. I couldn't imagine my life without it. Then one day, something amazing happened. My idea changed right before my very eyes. It spread its wings, took flight, and burst into the sky. I don't know how to describe it, but it went from being here to being everywhere. It wasn't just a part of me anymore. It was now a part of everything. And then I realized what you do with an idea. You change the world. Ah. Well, I hope that you can go out and change the world. We do that uh, by teaching. And uh, I know that if we take our ideas and build on them and uh, fertile, uh, cultivate them, that we will become better teachers. Uh, thanks for joining me today.